if poor Sugar Dells you walk, ye best not be a dawdler. In these woods a beast does stalk, our foe, the dread young gobbler. Just stay sharp with weapons handy, for it strikes out in a rush. With its coming goes our candy into licorice underbrush. Else your treats may join the piles neath the lair of the young gobbler. What is up, hey. everyone? <laughs> what is going on? Welcome, everybody, to today's demystifying series. We are currently in week three, so we're going to have a kind of mixed session between Rodolfo Silva and myself. So he'll be talking about uh, a little bit more about ZBrush and the substance workflow for texturing and whatnot. And then we'll transition over into Cinema 4D and Redshift and go ahead and get that started. So Again, I'm Dustin Volkema, welcome by Rodolfo Silva, and we have Kyle Johnstone in the back, and then Dr. Sassy is doing his magic for all of the cool things that you guys will see on the back end with the chapters and so on, the timestamps for the video. So let's do the housekeeping so that we can get right to the fun stuff, if we can switch. Haha, <laughs> there we go. All right, so first things first, uh, Something's Awry had an awesome one minute short, and then you saw some of the behind the scenes. Maxon.net, you will be able to see the uh, header banner here that has a link to where you can read a bit more about that, watch it again, and see some more in-depth behind the scenes. Next, we have Maxon Events, where you can see all of these sessions that we kind of have coming up uh, week by week or month to month and so on. So you can register for those here on maxon.net slash events. Next up, we have Cineversity. If you see me pause, like my computer, I think it's just because I have Redshift open currently. <laughs> my computer's like lagging on my side. So uh, just keep note of the links and then we can post those in the chat for you guys to click on. Uh, so Cineversity, a lot of cool series that are here for training. Uh, anywhere from the absolute beginner to advance. You'll have a lot of awesome knowledge here that you can glean from. Uh, everything from beginner introductory tutorials to much more advanced project breakdowns. Super cool place to find all of that information here. And the next one is the free t-shirt. So every month we give away free t-shirts here at Maxon. You have the spooky renders password to get into the link that is down in the description or in the comments right now collect to where all, you'll be man. able to access all of these shirts. What's that? You guys got to collect them all. It's like Pokemon. Yeah, collect them all. <laughs> <laughs> like Pokemon every week you get one. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and so, yeah, you can get in here, uh, free t-shirt. You just pay for the shipping. Everything else is covered by Maxon. And then lastly, we get to the Maxon certification. If you are looking to 
really gain a bit more confidence in your skill set, see where you sit. Maybe it's for a job in the industry that you're wanting to get to show how proficient you are in the software that that studio was using, or you want to get into education like Rodolfo and myself, where you're teaching the Maxon tools and so on, the certification process is the one that you will need to take to get there. So maxon.net slash certification. You can find a lot more information out here. And that is it for the housekeeping. I kind of stumbled my words trying to get through it a little bit because I know Rodolfo has some cool stuff to show today. So let's <laughs> go ahead and dive right into that. <laughs> hey, guys, it's me again. <laughs> So today, I thought we would go, as I mentioned last week, we go over the ZBrush to Substance workflow, and I'm going to do a little demo, uh, hopefully within enough time so Dustin can come over and start uh, with his part of the process, which includes like lighting and rendering and bringing the scene over to Cinema 4D and using Redshift for rendering. But in this case, I promised you guys I was going to do this. So uh, let's hope I can do it in like 30 minutes. <laughs> but let's see. So uh, it's going to be something like this. And I'm going to model from scratch uh, a tombstone, a very simple one, because we're not, again, we're on a schedule here. So I'm just going to start. And I'm going to start by, as you guys know, I don't really use these default uh, primitives right here. So I'm going to make Polymesh 3D, and then I'm going to switch over to my handy dandy gizmo and i'm going to use this cylinder right here so we're starting off like real quick all right just let me know if i'm going too fast or if there's any questions in the chat that pop i i'll just stop and, and answer those on the fly so uh starting off i prefer this one because you have this ability right here with the cones and you can just change the topology on the fly but in this case i'm going to stick to a fairly default ish let me just change this to like a an even number, maybe like uh, something like 12, uh, not 12 actually, I want something that's like, yeah, so like halfway, I wanna have this, this halfway kind of topology over there. So all right, so I'm gonna just scale this down to like 0.25 or something. And what I'm gonna use now is I'm gonna be heavily reliant on dynamic subdivision. I just press D. And by default, if you have no subdivision levels, pressing D will activate dynamic subdivisions over here, geometry, dynamic subdiv. If I press shift D, it turns it off. So D turns it on, shift D turns it off. In this case, I'm gonna roll this smooth uh, subdivision up to like six. And then before I do anything else, I'm gonna use this deformer here called the extender. And the extender effectively basically creates extra topology based on a midpoint. That's this little blue dot over here. So I want four of them. I preset this so I would go a little faster, but this topology here can be controlled in the resolution button over here. Not button, I'm sorry, a cone. One of these cones controls the resolution here. And then I turned off creasing, which is this yellow cone right here. You can apply creasing, something like this, or no creasing. In my case, I don't want any creasing. So I want to extend this maybe a little further to something like that. And then what I want to do is I want to delete this bottom section. So whoops, a daisy, not this one. So select all of those, reverse this, and then maybe I want to extend it. So I want that other topology there. So control shift X to expand uh, one span over here and control shift S will shrink basically this. And I don't know if you guys watched uh, Ian's stream, but he does this as well. And Paul, this I learned from Paul. So control shift S to shrink, control shift X to expand. And now I'm going to delete hidden. This is my custom menu, but this is like uh, basically geometry, modify topology, delete hidden. It's right over here. In case you really want to know where it is, modify topology, delete hidden right there. And weld points and close holes, it's everything there. So we have this and the reason i didn't want any topology here is because i want to close holes next so if i close holes and then i'm going to switch to my handy dandy z modeler brush and on the edges i'm going to tap and hold x um, space bar going to delete delete edge and i want to delete these because i don't want any weird pinching there so i don't want any triangles if you want something that's sculptable ideally you want to you want quads everywhere unless you're using sculptures pro of course so and now if i turn on my dynamic subdivisions again and now I want to crease this and I want to crease this by angle so this is going to be geometry crease 
and the crease tolerance in this case is 45 degrees and if, if I tap crease it's going to do this so I'm going to lower my crease level because it's too harsh so like two maybe maybe like three yeah something like this right and my uh, d smooth subdivision level is going to be at least two to three levels higher than my crease basically so if I have three I'm going to do like five or six in the smooth subdivisions in this case I want it I want six because this is super low poly so you're going to see any you don't see any faceting in there so we're going to do this and then I'm going to do another subtool I could have done everything in the same subtool but I want to show you guys how to properly name subtools to bring them into substance painter for proper baking etc this is a very common uh, workflow for games particularly in real time you want to split everything into your bake so you have a proper bake and then you want to merge them all together into a single in unreal we kind of call it static meshes right so we want to have one single static mesh for everything so i'm going to rename this i'm going to call this top underscore high so this is going to be my high poly right whoops this is the wrong keyboard layout sorry it's a us keyboard layout so okay so top high and i want to duplicate this over and i want to bring this down and I'm going to switch this to a cube. So I'm going to have a cube in the bottom. And I don't want any topology going over here because I want them to be perfect quads. So in this case scenario, what I want to do is I want to maybe scale this kind of like so. Maybe I want to scale this a little bit like that. So I might want to delete these. So insert in our Z modeler brush. Doesn't matter which one then because I'm going to alt tap away. And then if I want to use multiple edge loops, interactive resolution means I can interact with the amount of edge loops that I that I that I drop. And then I want to keep the same polygroup because I'm not really going to use too many polygroup features here. So if I click and drag now, I can just interactively add resolution over here. And I'm gonna add just enough to have at least well fairly similar squares over there. Same thing here. I want everything to be kind of even because once we subdivide this, then you don't want any weird offset in terms of like resolution, right? So maybe I want even yeah, something like that, right? So now if I press D, you can see even without any creasing, it already has some degree of sharpness, but we want to add the crease anyway. And now I'm going to lower my crease. Again, this is geometry crease. This is just my custom menu, right? But it's in, under geometry and crease. So I want to lower the crease level to like one, maybe two. No, actually one. Yeah, something like that. So you get a fairly similar kind of rounding out of the shape there. But this is all dynamic subdivision, right? So what we want to do now, just push this up a little bit. So they kind of connect there because we're going to have some cool immediate occlusion there, etc. So uh, what we want to do, because this is not actual geometry, you can see it's still like the low poly. This is just a preview. So we want to go to dynamic subdivisions and we want to apply this. Usually you would see me deleting the lower subdivision levels, but in this case, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave it like that so I can show you guys some cool things with, uh, with our, our UV master. Same thing goes for this one. So I'm going to apply that. We have seven subdivision levels this is too low i feel so it's like 167 so i'm going to divide this a couple more times Control d same as pressing this divide button and Control d again right so we have nine subdivisions let me go to the three and delete lower so we have seven on each one it's just because i'm ocd so <laughs> so i want to keep seven subdivisions on both right so you know, another thing we want to do is we want to change the name here to to bottom underscore high so Let's just call it bot, bot underscore high. And the naming is important here. You'll see in a second why. So, okay, so we have this, this is our high poly. And I'm gonna sculpt something real quick. Basically, it's just gonna go over this with my trim dynamic, that's BTD, brush and TD for trim dynamic. And I'm just gonna do a little bit of a symmetry here, but then I'm gonna break symmetry, of course. So just real quick, just 
breaking down this we can also use uh, if you have in the light box you have i think i showed this before but you have a couple of brushes here that are not loaded by default in zbrush and i use these all the time i use the the especially the smooth the trim and the mallet brushes there's a mallet brush somewhere here oh let me check where's the mallet brushes i always miss those oh there they are so mallet fast and mallet fast too i use them all the time and if you follow me on on um on zbrush live you know this especially for rocks and you know hard surface organic organicish kind of meshes you know because this is like this is a hard surface technically but it is it is not because it's a rock so it's kind of organic right so i use these all the time and i have them preloaded in zbrush in my case it's bm2 for mallet fast 2 bmj for mallet fast and mallet fast 2 kind of works in this scenario because you can just tap it away to get a very quick kind of broken up rock edges kind of effect you know so you have these and then i'm going to break symmetry sometimes just going over just tapping away going really fast for you guys over here so just if you're following along just be sure to take your time on these steps and you usually do take your time with the damage particularly because damage is where you do the storytelling right you you tell a story with a prop without actually telling a story so you kind of say all right, so maybe uh, if this is going to be integrated into like a, a battle scene or something, you want to have some slashes over here, or maybe you would go, okay, maybe there's not as much destruction on the bottom. There's more on the top because it's exposed, right? Or if there's like some sort of like prop here, like a skull with a candle, like we had before, maybe not as much damage over here because the skull is going to be there. So yeah, but in my case, I'm just trying to go fast for you guys so you can see the entire pipeline process in less ideally less than 40 minutes so i'm trying to go fast over here this is like a challenge for me going fast like <laughs> sonic the hedgehog over here like try i gotta go fast you know so going over here just tapping away so it, you kind of kill that roundness that perfect cg like roundness so metal uh, uh sorry mallet fast first i just break up the surface and this is like the name says, it's a mallet. So you tap away. I'm constantly tapping with my with my with my pen tablet, right? And then I'm gonna smooth this out, but not with a smooth brush. I use trim dynamic or uh, the orb flatten edge brush. So all right, so we got something pretty quickly. And then what I usually do is I try to I'm gonna go and do an orb rock detail just real quick to and I'm going to turn on back face masking. This is under brush, auto masking, back face masking. And this allows me to just push some, something over here and not affect the other side, right? Because sometimes when you drag, it's like a, a spherical kind of effect. It affects in the spherical kind of manner, right? It, it's not a circle like it displays here. It's a sphere, a sphere of influence, let's say. Huh. See what I did there? So on the other side, the same thing. I'm just going to go in and do some rock. Uh, patterns over here real quick and then what i like to do is one because i did this first because now i'm going to use the either the flatten edge brush uh, and lower the z intensity and then just go over this noise to break it up a little because i don't want i don't want this to be too prominent just a little bit so it it hides some of that noise and breaks up the repetition over there and now i'm going to push this up again and i'm going to go over the actual um, malleting that I did over here, the hammering down that I was just doing. So going over the entire mesh, just patiently, uh, usually a little, a little slower than I'm doing right now because you wanna really handcraft this. I'm just trying to go fast like Sonic the Hedgehog over here. So just keep doing it slow. If you're following along, this is gonna be available on VOD and on YouTube. So you can re-watch it and just try to follow along step by step if you if you feel like it if not it's fine we still love you so it's cool so let's just go over real quick because we don't want any baking issues over here so we might as well just try to i'm gonna do the mallet fast sometimes again because it, it kind of the rock noise kind of breaks up this and and makes this this weird kind of artifacting going on over here um actually i might have done it would be better to do it the other way to do first the noise and then the 
the mallet but when it's done it's done and i gotta go fast you know so that's the motto of today's stream so let's try to go faster here and do a little bit of polishing over here so you can see like even on, when i'm doing organic sculpts and some of you might not know this but before i was an environment artist i was actually a fine artist and i worked primarily with with um with char not characters but actually the figure like the human figure and one of the things you would do is when you you do that in ZBrush, like actually sculpting anatomy in ZBrush, you don't just smooth the surfaces after you block in your primary forms. You smooth them by sculpting, basically. So you sculpt in the, ter the secondary forms and then the tertiary forms, and that in itself kind of smooths out the surface. If you just smooth the surface, you lose form, right? So it's kind of the same thing here. I try to avoid the smooth brush in this case, Unless you're doing like pure hard surface, that's a whole different uh, ball game, right? Right. So we have this. This is pretty simple, but again, and uh, again, we're on the schedule. I'm gonna do the same thing here, but trying to go even faster. So uh, BM2 for mallet, and I'm gonna do symmetry because I don't want to waste you guys' time. So I'm gonna go and push the Z intensity a little bit. Just tap away and trying to use symmetry and then I'm going to break up symmetry with the orb. Again, usually you wouldn't have that much destruction on the bottom because it, it's in the ground so it gets like erosion and soften. It gets softened up with time. Uh, in this case, I'm just again trying to excuse myself <laughs> and going really fast and breaking up symmetry a little bit over here. Doing it over here and then going over to my orb flatten edge and smooth it out. Is there any questions in the chat? I mean, this is kind of boring. It's just me going over polishing up the surface. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's ever particularly boring. I, I feel like there's a <laughs> lot. There, there's a lot to learn from from an, an artist working faster than they may normally work. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, mean, for it, instance. It, like I, yep. I learn the best from watching like speed art. So once I pass like understanding the fundamentals, say of, of ZBrush or, or Cinema 4D and Redshift, like once I understand where things are and like the general fundamentals, I like to watch, you know, speed art and, and things like that, because that helps you get a lot faster uh, yeah. progression, um, at true. least for me, you know, some people learn different, you know, but it's it's interesting watching you work faster it's it yeah. is it's kind of finding the fastest way from point a to point b and we talk a lot on the stream about you know knowing when a project's finished and and finding that balance between finished and perfect yeah and so Th that's it's true. cool to see this because you know what may be dull for you in <laughs> yeah. most cases like this type of thing may be exactly what clients want like most of the time they just want it like good yeah, real you quick. know and, and cheap and and they you know they try to throw in fast and so sometimes you just have to work fast and, and get it finished and you know avoid the flaws yeah it's true it's true and most of the times even when you're in iteration in the iteration phase you really want to pour out something really fast just for the art director to approve or something and yep. then you want to go in and maybe fine-tune this of course in this case we're talking a uh, texturing iteration and not just uh uh, the modeling part, but the modeling as well, you can just go over here. And especially if we were using something like Dynamesh or Sculptures Pro, this would even be, um, let's say, easier to iterate on because you don't need to worry about topology, right? So there's a, that, old, um, that old aspect of iteration. There's a, a couple of, of, of streamers that I usually, usually refer to when I'm, when I'm talking about iteration. And number one is usually Michael Pavlovich. That's, that's literally number one because his... Uh, is really fast in <laughs> ZBrush. If right. you guys think this is fast, man, <laughs> you haven't watched Michael Pavlovich's stream, man. Last one was crazy. So, but yeah, this is a very basic kind of a, a tombstone kind of effect, right? Let me just do a little bit of rock detail. This is going to be important. This this kind of detail over here, it is kind of important because it's going to come through and show in the bake, right? When you're baking the normal maps, you're baking ambient occlusion curvature. All of this little details that you put in here is going to be uh, coming through as a texture and in, in substance, right? So let me just finish up this real quick because, again, that surface noise gives me some pinching over here. So I'm just trying to work that out. 
but this is fine for the demo for demo purposes this is fine right so we have our little tombstone right over here right and we have our high poly and then if we do shift d now because this has subdivisions we have a low poly you could use this as your low poly but the problem with this is that you're going to get in terms of silhouette you can see it's very different than your high poly you can maybe you can't see but if you do shift d you can see that the the kind the the silhouette of the mesh is different than in your high poly that's either going to be an issue when you're baking which sometimes it isn't depends on in this case it's a cube so it won't be an issue but if you're doing it for let's say a game ready asset or something in real time this is going to be noticeable because you can actually get a fair result with your bakes and your normal maps but once the model is like rotating around or you rotate around the model with your camera, you don't want it to, you don't want to break that illusion of it being super high well with a lot of detail, right? By having a, a very a very clunky silhouette, right? So what I usually do, in this case I'm going to do it on this one because it's a kind of simpler model. I want to have UVs first, right? Because we want to bake this into a texture. So I'm going to roll it back to the lowest subdivision because uh, UV Master and Z Modeler work on the lowest subdivision. In this case, uh, I'm actually going to do that on this one, though. I'm going to go back to the lowest subdivision, Control W for a single polygroup, right? And then I'm going to go back to my Z Modeler, and I want to polygroup, and I want to tell it to polygroup a polyloop. And now if you go in, you can see when you hover over a face, there's these orange arrows, right? They're telling you the direction. So if I press it now, it's going to go around to this side on the poly loop. But if I press it when it's pointing up, it's going to polygroup a poly loop going around the mesh, right? Which is what I want. So I want to split split these two into different poly groups. And I could just stay here and, and paint this by hand. Or I could just control shift tap this go back, go down here to my poly groups. Where's the poly groups? Uh, I use my custom menu, guys, you have to. And do auto groups, because once once I select these two, technically they're not touching each other. So they're, they're, ZBrush interprets this as kind of like two separate meshes in the same subtool. So if I do auto groups, they're gonna be seen as separate entities, right? And now control shift tap control shift tap in between these two poly groups control w and we have two poly groups right and now in my lowest subdivision level this is important go to z plugin uv master turn on poly groups because you want the poly groups to dictate where your seam is going to be and then unwrap and it's going to be fast because it's you know lowest subdivision level this is weird topology but you know it's a demo right <laughs> real quick but so if we go now back to our highest subdivision level and we delete lower because we don't want we don't want this clunky silhouette right here we want we want this one right so what we're going to do is going to do a decimation master workflow where we have our sub our our uvs if i delete lower again this is let me go to the actual menu so you guys can see geometry and under the subdivision levels delete lower and this is our uh well our high poly basically but it has uvs if i go back here to the uv map and push down the bump and click morph uv these are my uvs basically so it's done we have uvs so let me unmorph this and now what i want to do in order to preserve this in our in my low poly first of all i want to duplicate this because i want to have my low poly as a separate mesh Ideally, so duplicate this and I'm going to rename this top underscore low. So this is my low poly, right? I'm going to push this down here. There you go. And now what I want to do is since this, this already has UVs, I can go into Z plugin, go to my decimation master, and I want to press this button called keep UVs. And this is going to preserve the UVs regardless of the amount of topology that you want to have in your decimated mesh. And I need to pre-process this. It's going to take a while, but it's basically after this, you don't want to change anything in the topology and you don't want to change the name of the subtool, right? Because this is storing this in cache in your hard drive. So it's referring to that mesh, that 
and it has a naming convention, right? If you change the name of the topology, it won't find the match. You have to pre-process again. And one other thing that I see people making a mistake all the time is they feel they have to pre-process every time they decimate. They don't. You only have to, to pre-process once, and then you can decimate as many times as you want. You can shift the, te the topology up and down as you'd like. I'm going to show you guys. So it's pre-processing. It's reordering now. This is a writing file to disk. You can see it's writing it to cache. So now you have this. And if we go back to our Z plugin, it's already pre-processed. I don't need to touch that anymore. So if I'm going to go, let's say I want this to be 10% and then decimate current. And this is my mesh. And I'm like, oh, this is still too high poly. So I might want, let's say I want to type in an exact number. I want 10,000 triangles. And now I just need to press decimate current and it's instant, right? You don't need to pre-process again. This is literally just it. And you can see the silhouette is way better than it was in our lowest subdivision level, which you can still use for certain situations, that other workflow. But I prefer to use this one, especially for hard surface, non-deformable models. Of course, if it's a character or something, that's not going to work because you want a deform deformation. So ideally, you would even have to do by hand your retopology, right? So th this is for like just a tombstone, right? Even if it's going to be destroyed, there's like procedural things you can do in Houdini and Unreal and stuff like that to, to do destruction physics and all of that. So there's all these sort of other apps that will help you with this. This is fine for now. So we have like 10,000 uh, triangles in our low poly and I'm going to do the same thing uh, where, okay. Uh, oh, it's up. Okay. Same thing over here, right? So in this case, I'm going to do a different workflow. I'm going to go up. Let's imagine that in this case, I already had deleted my, my lowest subdivision levels. And I don't want to reconstruct because you can reconstruct your subdivision levels. And there it is, right? Oh, no. Is it going to crash? Oh, Jesus, please, no. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's not going to crash. So you can reconstruct, but let's imagine that you can't for some reason. There are multiple scenarios where you can't reconstruct your subdivisions. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to use Z remesh before using dy dynamic subdivision. I want to have some UVs here. So first of all, I want polygroups. You can also use now creasing in your Z modeler to, to assign the seams for your, you can actually hand cut your seams now in ZBrush with Z modeler, which is something, it's a kind of a new feature and most people are still not using it, but there's, there's, there's that as well. But in this case, or even let's imagine this is like a DynaMesh mesh or something, and you really don't have any like orderly topology. So in this scenario, what I usually do is first of all, I control tap this undo history. So I'm storing, I'm telling ZBrush, hey, hey, remember the mesh as it is in this state, right? So I have my, my history there saved. And what I want to do now is I want to go control shift and select the slice curve brush. And I want to slice it around the middle over there. So now we have two polygroups and a perfect edge loop going around the mesh, right? Which is what we want for the UVs and et cetera. And now we want to go to geometry, Z, Z remesher, and we want to turn on keep groups. First of all, let me just duplicate this because I forgot. I want to have my bottom underscore low, right? This is important, right? And I want to go over here and undo this because all I want is the high poly. And I want to do the same thing over here, right? Tap the 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 undo history so zbrush kind of remembers the details over here right and then it has the uvs it has a, a two polygroups with a slice in the middle so we're going to go over to z remesh you want to um we want to press this keep groups button this is going to say all right i want to keep that edge that goes in the border between two polygroups right so it's going to do like an edge loop around this for sure Right? And we want that because we want our UV seam, seam to be over here. So if I do, I usually do a same and I, want, I don't want this to smooth. Maybe I want just like 0.1 of smoothing. This is basically a polish, right? Polish by groups in ZBrush. Adaptive size, I usually turn it down to like 10. And this is like the size of the, of, the, of the quads, right? After the Z remesh, I want them to be pretty consistent, but not completely consistent. I want it to have some leniency when doing this weird kind of um, 
uh, transitions here. So if I press zero mesh, it's going to try, it's going to still reduce a little bit the topology. I hope my stream doesn't lag due to this, but um, it might lag a little bit. Mm, am I lagging? Maybe not. No, not anymore though, because it's finished. So there we go. And you can see a zero mesh kind of preserve this edge loop going around the mesh, which is perfect. So now let's do a couple of more, but let's press half the polygon counts. Like let's do, let's just do zero mesh again, and it's gonna go faster each time, each time because it has less polygons to deal with. So maybe another one, something like that. Maybe we could do another. There we go. And you can see it's kind of losing detail. So one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why I tapped control on that undo, undo history is because now I can project without using a, diff, a separate subtool, right? Because a lot of people do project, basically they duplicate the subtool, then they do project, and then, oh, there's another subtool there. It's kind of influencing my projection. And if you don't want that, you can just project history. So basically now we have this, let's do, first of all, our UV master with polygroup. So unwrap, and there we go. If we go down here to our morph UVs, turn down the bump, these are my UVs, basically. So we have UVs for this one as well. And now I want to get back that detail because I want to decimate this. So if I control D, you can see it's going to basically soften everything. But since I stored that undo history, I'm going to up, go up here to my under sub tool project turn off color you don't want the color because we have no poly paint and project history and there we go and now i'm going to subdivide again control d project history subdivide one more time and project history and we effectively retained imagine that was your dynamesh mesh right and you want to have clean topology this would be the workflow i would just slice it and maybe give it some indications of where I want edge loops with either zero mesh guides or the slice curve brush. And then just use this workflow of rolling it back in zero mesher and then projecting the history back as I divide it. And then I have UVs as well. So now effectively I can delete all my lower subdivisions and I have the same high poly kind of mesh with UVs and with all the detail. So now, Effectively, I can just go over here to Z plugin and I want the, oh Jesus, my brain just froze. <laughs> Keep UVs under decimation master, pre-process current, and then we're gonna go and maybe do 10,000 again, 10,000 triangles, okay? So there you go. And this is just a quick way. Let's imagine this works with anything that doesn't deform so if you really want to bring something into like a game engine or a rendering pipeline or whatever really quick and then iterate on that to actually see how it's going to look like in the final render or in the final game or whatever you're doing, this is a very easy workflow to iterate back on because we spent like 30 minutes, 40 minutes just bringing them, uh, bringing the decimated mesh into the engine and that's it. So it's pre-processed. So I want to type in 10K and decimate current. And now we have effectively actually 5,000. It for some reason decided it's 5,000, but it's okay. So basically we have the same, we have an edge loop. We have these same UVs here. If we go down here to morph UVs with our decimated mesh and morph it, you can see we have kind of the same UVs, right? But we have UVs, right? So there we go. This is also... This could also work if you're bringing in a low poly mesh from other software. If you prefer to use either Cinema 4D or Maya or whatever you use for retopology, retopologize that, bring them into ZBrush, and then just project that detail so you make sure that it's there, subdivide it, and use Decimation Master to have the actual silhouette going around. And you can see it's pretty close, like it's clipping through the, the high poly, so it's pretty close. So we have our high poly and low poly. One of the things I use all the time for export, if I want to export these out as two separate files, are my high poly and my low poly, is I use the visibility sets. And you can say, oh, but it's just a couple of meshes, it's fine. Yeah, but let's imagine you have a tool that has like 50 uh, 
high poly and 50 low poly right meshes and this can be a nuisance right so what i usually do is i stick my visibility set one to just my high poly so this is effectively my high poly and visibility set two is going to be my low poly and again imagine you have a ton of low poly meshes and a ton of high poly meshes this is an ideal workflow because then you can just switch between your high poly and low poly by switching these and you can sign, assign hotkeys to this so you can actually just press a hotkey and switch the visibility sets right so i'm going to export this i'm going to go z plugin and fbx export import and i'm going to press this visible button and effectively what this means is that any sub tool that has this little icon here this little eye icon is going to be exported that's why i did the vis visibility set so let me just close this real quick and what I'm going to do is I'm going to export this and I'm going to call this tomb because I already have like a tombstone there. I'm going to call this tomb underscore low. This is my low poly. So there you go. And now just switch to visibility, visibility set one and then select one of them. Because if you have something here that's selected, it's going to export that. So it's, it was going to export my low poly. So I have to select some of the any of my high poly sub tools, right? Go back to Z plugin, export, and I'm gonna call it the same name, but underscore high. Uh, yeah, underscore high, sorry. So underscore high, this is gonna take a little longer, cause a lot more geometry, like 4 million polygons or something. It's not a lot, but it is still. And I have Maya open over here because I use this, this is literally all I use Maya for. Nowadays I use ZBrush for everything, but I use Maya for like material ID assigning and some textile density. In this case, we don't need that. But basically what I wanna do is I wanna assign two separate materials and I wanna assign two separate materials because, because we wanna have two separate textures, right? Because there's two separate sub tools and you have to remember ZBrush takes one texture per sub tool, right? So we want to import this. Let me go and import what I just exported. There you go, tomb below. And we have our tomb over there. And it, those those little things, green things, are my face normals. I usually have them on because that's literally all I use Maya for is retopology. So it's a good idea to see where the normals are pointing at. So we have this, and it's just a matter of selecting this and assigning a different material. And then I'm gonna call this top. And this is gonna be the name of my texture, basically, in Substance. We could do this in Substance as well, renaming the texture set, but I prefer to do this because even, I usually work with an Unreal Engine pipeline. And if you bring this over to Unreal, Unreal is gonna know it's a different material ID. So it's a different material slot, let's say. So we have two materials. In this case, I might as well just, just do it in here so i'm going to assign a different material over here doesn't matter which one it's just for id purposes so i'm going to call this bottom so we have a top material over there just delete whoops uh, delete history control shift alt shift d and we have top delete history here and we have bottom and now i'm just going to re-export this and overwrite our previous file basically so tomb below and I didn't do this in ZBrush because you would argue, okay, you could assign a different material in ZBrush, but because I'm still not sure, I haven't tested out that workflow, but I'm pretty sure materials in ZBrush are assigned to the vertex, to the vertices, right? So if they're assigned to the vertices, they're not actually a material, they're like vertex color. So the technology is kind of different and I'm not sure if Substance would read that unless it's like baked in as a color ID map. So in this case, we're doing this, and then I have my my substance. I'm gonna create a new one. This is just me testing it out before the stream. So you guys didn't have to, you know, there are no uh, hiccups <laughs> during the stream. There's always hiccups, but you know. So I'm gonna create a new file over here and I'm gonna select my low poly in substance. When you create a new project, you usually have to select your low poly meshes. And I'm gonna select the files that I just re-exported, tomb underscore low. Press OK, the 4K texture, we're not doing 4K unless you guys want to sit out like an hour waiting for a bake to finish, but whatever. So we have our low poly over here and you can see it has the silhouette, but it kind of lost a lot of that detail because it's, it's a low poly, right? So 
what we're going to have to do is do a bake. And you can see now that you have two texture sets. The, this is because I assigned those two materials, in my case in Maya, but this works in any DCC app from Cinema 4D to Blender to Moto to whatever you're using, uh, 3ds Max, whatever. So in this case, I want to bake some textures first because you want to bake your mesh maps so your materials, so you can then assign uh, mask generators and all of that to the um, to the using those curvature maps and thickness and all of that again we can't go really in depth into this as much as i would want because we only have an hour but i'm gonna do a little q a session in my next zbrush live stream i usually do that now like first one hour of my stream is going to be a q a and i'm gonna expand upon this and expand upon this bringing it back into zbrush to create all sorts of crazy textures so you can use in your zbrush projects so basically baking this means that i need to assign where my high polys are and i want to have my two high and here's the important thing here's why i named all my sub tools right i named all my sub tools because you can actually match them by the naming convention. So it's gonna basically bake them out separately um, based on their name. So if I have two meshes that have the same name except for the suffix, basically underscore high or underscore low, they're gonna bake together. And this avoids all sorts of like baking issues when it's clipping through, meshes clipping through, etc. So we're gonna have that. We're going to match by mesh name, and this is usually caps, but I didn't do caps. This is important because it's case sensitive. So high poly, it's going to be low. I'm going to push this uh, to the side so you guys can see our faces or whatever. And now uh, mesh name, again, ambient occlusion, I don't want it to be matched by mesh name. I want it always because we want to have that little like gradation there from ambient occlusion, right? So I don't need an ID map. This would be like if you have like poly paint that you want to be baked into a texture. Sometimes I do that if I want to split them up even further in my layering system. I would have some like something like a red color for a certain material like wood and then like blue color for something like uh, like metal or something in ZBrush in poly paint and then bake that out as vertex color. But I don't need that right now. So I'm going to do a very quick bake. Let's just do a 1k so we don't have to sit here for like hours just waiting for this it's not going to take hours because it's a pretty hefty machine but still so we're going to do a bake and let's see if it goes as it did a few hours ago <laughs> let's see if there are no wake ups uh no it's fine so it's doing it it's baking perfectly since the mesh is decimated it's sitting exactly on top of the high poly which means it's going to prevent any sort of baking issues you might have if you did a hand retopo and for some reason there's some sections that are not really matching the high poly in this case you know it's matching because it's a decimated version of that and you can see we have now our ambient occlusion over there that's why i didn't match it by name for the ambient occlusion but if you can if you go to normal not this normal the mesh map normal you can see it's not giving you any like bleeding through because it's matched by mesh name. We had it underscore low and underscore high in the ZBrush in the ZBrush subtool palette, right? So now if you go over here, I pre-made these materials here: ZBrush Stylite, ZBrush Live Stone, ZBrush Live Bone. These are materials I made in Substance Painter, and again, we can expand upon this. Uh, later in a different st stream but for now I just created this and now I'm going to drag and drop here and it's going to use all of those maps the curvature map etc to create this edge highlight kind of workflow I did a lot of like generators over here that kind of take advantage of that detail that was we baked can, in from I'm sorry we, we we can take a little bit if you want to if you want to go a little bit into it mm -hmm. um it kind of sounds like you're about to explain a few things yeah but if you want to kind of like break down maybe not uh building it from scratch uh so we have we're at about 1250 right now uh so we can we can oh, take wow. some time um <laughs> you know I, I don't i don't mind i don't mind kind of passing on some of like the cinema 40 and regsys stuff uh this we're, week we're basically then, done it's just then yeah. exporting this and flipping it over in photoshop and applying it in zbrush and that's it basically so i didn't i couldn't manage 30 minutes but that's because i'm talking as well <laughs> so it's dang it 
<laughs> I need to go supersonic next time. So uh, yeah, so basically you would use a, a very simple kind of layering system like you would in Photoshop or something like that. And I would use generators to actually look at, if you look at this, this, the properties here on the generator, it's actually looking at the curvature, right? And in this case, the edges is just a simple color, basically. And if you look here at the mask, uh, sorry, you have to select the mask. If you look at the mask, it's basically applying it everywhere except where there are sharp edges because I, I inverted the curvature. So if you go over here, it's uh, well, it's not inverted here, but it is, it is inverted somewhere for some. Oh, there it is. It's in the levels. I inverted it here. In the levels. So if I, you know, if I do, I did a flipped, I flipped the levels basically here. So this is like Photoshop, right? You're doing, you're having filters on. You have all the filters, not all of them, but most of the filters that you have available on Substance Designer, you have in Substance Painter as well. If you use Substance Designer, you know, like. It's basically painter, but on steroids. <laughs> so, and it's node based. So there, it's a lot more procedural and, and non-destructive than painter. This is still a non-destructive workflow. Don't get me wrong. Cause you have this, the, the mesh maps, but the difference is it all depends on the quality of your bake. If you have a, a, a I did a 1k bake, which is not ideal, but if you have like a 4k bake or something like that, it would give you a much better result. And then you have something like cavities, which use, in this case, I think ambient occlusion. So let's go mask. It has some grunge texture. So I basically added a texture here and texture two opacity. And then you can go down here and just tell it, hey, which, which texture, like the, where's the well, micro height? Where, oh, Jesus, I'm lost. <laughs> yeah, there it is. It's grunge rough dirty. Then there's grunge rough uh, rust fine. And then you can tweak those kind of procedurally here. This is basically this mask editor. If you really want to go deep into substance, if you know substance designer, these are all made in designer basically. And then it's shipped in painter as sort of like a feature, the mask editor. So the, all of these parameters here are basically exposed parameters in designer. So you can actually twist, uh, uh, tweak them on the fly and it's non-destructive. It's not, painting per se. So this is one of the things I usually do in painter. And then I go by hand when I need to break that kind of procedural nature of it. But in this case, it kind of works pretty well. So this is basically looking at the, at the, at the ambient occlusion, some curvature in this case, and it, it, this one is inverted. And then there's like, so it basically it's applying it to wherever there's cavities. In this case, there isn't many because I forgot one step. <laughs> in ZBrush, I forgot the surface noise step, but that's fine. It's usually just to create some procedural cracks and all of that, but it works for this case. So this is just a variation. So it's basically just a color. And then instead of using a mask editor, I use a light. So it's basically like a baked light, like a spotlight, but it's baked into the texture. It's baked into the color texture in this case, because I'm using the base color and some roughness as well. Actually, I don't need roughness because the roughness should come through from the good. I'm tweaking the material on the fly. <laughs> it's not as perfect as I thought it was. So there you go. So there's the light and we can just rotate this light around. Whoa, this is slow. Wow. Is it because I'm streaming? Am I lagging? I am lagging, right? <laughs> Might as well just not tweak bit. this too much. Yeah. So it's variation, then ambient occlusion, kind of bleeding a little bit of a red. And the cool thing about this is just that you can just tweak the color like as you want. So this, you can apply this smart material to any other mesh and then just tweak the colors and tweak the masks and it's done. So it's a good idea. It's a good practice. If you know you're going to have a lot of assets that are like stone or the same type of material to just build one very simple asset, create a smart material from that and then just apply it to whatever sculpts you have done in ZBrush. Then some baked, baked lighting, like stylized lighting. So this is all just adding little layers of variation onto uh, more layers of variation. So you have some texture breakup over here, which I did go into a little more deep. So it's basically a grunge texture. Let me just uh, go back all the layers. So let's go mask. This is just a, a regular grunge texture. Then I blur it. And then I did a blur slope. Again, if you're a substance designer, uh, user, you know what a blur slope is and you use this all the time. 
and then you do a little bit of a levels to up the contrast over here and then more contrast luminosity to a point where it, basically it's a black and white image it's like a, some splatters right so it's effectively using kind of like a substance designer workflow but for substance painter using layers instead of noses of noises right instead of noses that was a cool one that's a cool <laughs> yeah, cool uh gaff there so there you go so we have this kind of color breakup in here and this is basically what i would apply to the other texture set was which is this bottom so just drag and drop it over here and there we go uh wow is it not working huh there it is yeah okay because when we baked we baked both of them at the same time we did bake when you do this you can bake just the selected texture set or select or everything that you have over here selected and I had everything selected so everything's baked so there we go now how do I export this so basically I go to file export textures and what I usually do is I create my own template because in unreal in an unreal engine kind of workflow you usually pack your ambient occlusion roughness and metal maps into the same texture because they're black and white and this is to save memory costs right for for games so usually I would have these, these are all my templates from for Unreal. So base color, normal map, and then you have ambient occlusion, roughness, and metal in the same texture. And then a displacement map in case you want to use it for like vertex color painting in Unreal and stuff like that. Like, or some weird shader magic that I enjoy doing because I enjoy doing technical art for, for materials. So that's a thing. And, but I have my own template here for ZBrush textures. In case of ZBrush, because I want to use the ambient occlusion separately, I want to use the roughness, and maybe Dustin wants that too in Cinema 4D. He wants to have each map separate into its own texture so he can do whatever he wants. So I decided to split this up into their own. Um, I even had the curvature. So if Dustin wants to do something with the curvature, I have the curvature over here. So curvature, metal, AO, roughness, displacement, normal, and base color. So all I have to do is if I create my, my template, go to settings, choose your folder, whatever, in this case, I'm going to call it ZBrush Live. I'm going to just export there because I'm, I'm not that organized. So, <laughs> and then roll it here in the output template. Just go back and select your, your template and that's it. That's literally it. Just export this. And the final step, if you want to use these, these textures in ZBrush, you have to remember that the UVs in ZBrush are flipped vertically. That means the V coordinate is minus one, basically. So what you want to do is you want to go to Photoshop, open up those textures over here. This, these are not those textures, by the way. These are the ones I tested previously. So you want to open these up. And I want to open these up. And where is it? Mm. Let me just organize this by date again. There you go. So base color. And we want to open up the top base color. We're just going to use base color for now. We have these over here, right? And we want to go to edit and go to, uh, not edit, I'm sorry. Image, image rotation, flip vertically. Same thing here, image, image rotation, flip vertically. And now I wanna save this as, and I'm gonna save it as a JPEG. And I wanna call it T bottom underscore. You can see those two that I, I was just testing. So T bottom underscore BC, and I usually call it underscore ZB. So I know it's a ZBrush, it's going to ZBrush, so it's flipped, right? And again, same thing here, file, save as, JPEG. And we're going to call it top BCZB. We're going to overwrite this one. Let's call it ZB2 <laughs> because, you know, that's what you do. Usually you just put a two on the <laughs> at the end and that's it. So now in ZBrush, in my low poly, let's go V2 to this that has UVs. I can just scroll down here. And I don't, I can't have my Z modeler brush. So go to clay build up or something and just go to my texture map, import, and I'm going to import that uh, JPEG that I can't find anymore. <laughs> there it is. Okay, so there's ZB, bottom ZB, and there's your texture. Same thing for my, high, my, my top section. So if I go over here, again, import, and there's the top, uh, top ZB2. Where's the ZB2? There you go. 
and we have textures now. So then you can tweak the material here, you can tweak the intensity of your diffuse. In this case, it's not called diffuse because it's a different it's a orb clay material. It's more of like a matcap material. So, but you can tweak this. And then again, I have my, my BPR renders. I didn't manage to go through the BPR filters and all of that. Again, this is a one hour stream, so it's not, uh, not ideal for that kind of thing. It's a very, there's a lot to unpack here. But I'm more than happy to just go through the BPR filters on ZBrush Live if there's a demand for it. So basically, if I render this out, there's a render with textures and some filters and etc. And you can just go like super close and you have all that detail over here. Of course, there's not a lot going on over here, but that's because it's a very simple kind of kind of mesh. And we have like a cool vignette over here some nice glowing effects some emphasis on the curvature as well so and there we go this is my this is usually my workflow between zbrush to substance and then substance back into zbrush there's multiple things that i could have covered here that are not possible within one hour but uh yeah this is it this is the result basically so i do have a question so at, at what point uh, would you just resort for something like this uh, to use poly paint versus going to substance? Uh, like, do you so, have like a defining point at, you know, would, where you do that? Yeah. So poly paint usually for me is for something that's a little bit less uh, detailed in terms of texturing, because there's not, even though ZBrush has a lot of like masking features that you can use to mask it and apply poly paint, et cetera, it's never going to be the same result as actually using mask generators in, in substance with uh, curvature maps, for example, because there's no curvature map in ZBrush. Everything's topology. Z it's geometry because it's a sculpting app, right? So this amount of detail when it comes to like the edge wear, et cetera, you can never get from polypaint. What I can do is I actually can use polypaint and then bake that into a texture and use that texture as like a base in my substance painter workflow. So what I could do is I could go over here and start painting. Let's just say I want to go B P A for paint and I'm going to paint like a red color or something. Wow. Okay. First of all, I want to, I want to apply this color first, the white color, right? So fill object first. So now in my subtool palette, it has that little icon over there. That's like poly paint. And I want to paint something like, I don't know, like some red strokes. And again, you have to, this is also an issue because this is my low poly, right? So if you want to bake that into your UVs, you might as well have UVs in your high poly as well, because this is topology based. This is, this is basically vertex color, right? But if I wanted that, I wanted to have that, I could just paint. Let's imagine this is a high poly, right? And go over here. I could actually paint, but I'm going to change the topology. It's going to ruin the, the UVs. I was going to go Sub Sculptures Pro, but if you change the topology, it's going to ruin your UVs, basically, because the, it won't have UVs on that, right. on that different uh, geometry. So if I go over here to uh, New from Poly Paint, it's going to create a new texture with my poly paint. So I would paint the most that I can in ZBrush as a base and then do this and then just export this texture, right? So I could just clone texture and now you have your texture over here and you can export it, right? And then use that in substance as a separate layer or something to just build upon that poly paint using all my generators and curvature maps and all of that. So there is a... a a spot for poly paint, let's say, in that workflow. And I do use it sometimes. I used it for stuff like the, the door in my final scene. I started out with just a couple of colors with some masking. And then in, in substance, I actually went the extra mile to do all the nuanced curvature highlights and bake stylized lighting into the base color. It's a very common workflow in, in stylized art, right? Baking everything into the base color, all the lighting information. Um, so yeah, this is basically what I would do if I were using, if I was using a, a poly painting, uh, workflow basically. Yeah. Sweet. So I'm looking to, uh, to see if there are any questions. Uh, we've already touched on 
uh, how and, and why you use something like substance versus the poly paint. Mm -hmm. So do we have links uh, that you can share uh, for your ZBrush Live? Yeah, um, yeah, I do. Uh, things maybe, well, basically, maybe you can Discord. Yeah, so ZBrush Live, it's basically ZBrush Live. So if you go to the Pixelectric ZBrush YouTube channel, you can actually just, let me just type in, see if Kyle can, can put them, put those links. So the, these are the streams basically from ZBrush, their ZBrush channel. And then you have the Discord, my Discord server, where you can post any questions you might want. I might do a couple of like private Discord streams as well. When it comes to like longer like workflow streams that are not just involved in ZBrush, there's a lot of things in the pipeline between ZBrush to like a final uh, game ready asset, let's say, for either games, virtual production, real time visualization from architecture, whatever. A lot of industries use game engines nowadays, not just the games industry per se. So that kind of workflow is being used more and more nowadays. And I'm going to do uh, a couple of private streams in the future. I already told them that on the server. So here's the server as well. Uh, I think this is it. Let me just check. Yes, this is it. Okay. It's by mistake. I might have posted like Ian's servers. <laughs> you know? So there you go. So those are the links that I just sent over to Kyle. And uh, okay. usually I answer questions there. And if there's something that's very specific or very, that would require a very more, a more like an in-depth explanation of some features, I usually cover it on stream on the ZBrush Live. Uh, I did that with the IMM curve brush thing with the triparts, all of that, that I also covered here on demystifying post-production. But then I went, I did it like a one, two hour Q and A session on, on ZBrush Live, which was, was cool because people were engaged in, and I feel like it helped a lot of people, you know, because it's, it's sometimes when you're on your own, you're kind of stumbling across information on the internet and it's not that easy to find. And then you have someone just to direct you, Hey, go watch ZBrush live, go watch Cineversity or go watch Michael Pavlovich's channel or, or Z classroom or whatever. It's easier when you have a, sure. a direction, right? So yeah, this is it. Is there any more questions regarding workflows or anything actually? Yeah. Except so like what I had to eat for lunch that that's like useless information, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, stream Streamworks is asking if we, uh, if we want some coffee, I would love coffee. That sounds great, yeah. man. Uh, happy morning. I already have, I already <laughs> had like two of them. <laughs> so, uh, we're, we're kind of out of time today for the uh, cinema 40 and redshift side. Um, so oh, I'm sorry, man. Well, well, no, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's no problem, man. I love, I love watching you work and I'm sure that you as well. Uh, so what we'll do is next week, we're going to pick up a bit more on the cinema 40 and redshift side. Uh, let me know in the comments, uh, and in chat, if you would rather see more of an overview on the redshift lighting, uh, and kind of some basic materials, and then maybe watch, a bit more of like a Photoshop post-production uh, workflow type of stream. Uh, so we can do a, an overview in Cinema 40 and Redshift and then using those render passes in Photoshop, uh, kind of mixing them with some overlays and different stuff to really make everything pop. Uh, or we can just spend the entire hour in Cinema 40 and Redshift and really kind of deep dive into uh, a bit more of maybe the why I make decisions versus exactly how to do it. Cause I have plenty of streams out, um, you know, on, on doing redshift lighting, uh, last year's, uh, Halloween, I believe it was a Halloween, Halloween demystifying series that we had challenges. I had a one light challenge where I used a sculpt from Ian and did a whole series using a single light source and building upon that. So that's pretty cool. If you want to go back and watch that, um, you know, please do so. All right. So we're seeing, cool. uh, yes, render passes. So maybe that's what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll take the week and I'll, I'll break things up a little bit differently. Cause I know we ran out of time today. So we'll have a pretty cool session going into cinema 40 and Redshift, And then we'll dive into Photoshop and, uh, get the best of both worlds. So also, by the way, a lot of you guys have been posting like Halloween challenge 
pictures of like work that you, you guys been doing in ZBrush and Cinema 4D and all of that stuff. It just started as a unofficial kind of challenge when Ian mentioned it and everyone just started working and watching these streams and just, that was awesome. I would like to congratulate everyone who has been doing that. That's awesome without having yeah. like an actual official challenge. It's yeah, really let's cool. uh we'll we'll have to we'll have to put that on our list of things to do this week. <laughs> we'll pull some, we'll pull some and maybe showcase a little bit in the uh in the housekeeping next week. Yeah. So awesome. Cool. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. And uh Rodolfo and Kyle in the background. Thank you guys. Thanks for everyone watching and all the comments and good stuff coming in. And with that, we will wrap up this week's demystifying series, and we will see you next week at the same time and place. See you, everyone. Bye. Bye. If poor Sugar tells you walk, ye best not be a dawdler. In these woods a beast does stalk, our foe, the dread young gobbler. Just a sharp with weapons handy, for it strikes out in a rush. With its coming goes our candy into liquid underbrush. Your treats may join the piles neath the lair of the young gobbler.